Uh, we're back in First Peter this morning. I tell you, every so often I, I'm afraid I get swift because Acts is talking so much about Peter and Peter's written by Peter. I'm afraid I'm going to flip-flop and do the Acts message in the morning and the Peter message in the evening. And I was looking at my notes uh, yesterday. It's like, okay, no, it's Peter, right? I'm doing Peter in the morning. Yes, Peter's in the morning, Acts is in the evening. Um, so we're in, we're in chapter 2. We talked about the key of, of Peter, and that is in uh, verse 9, where he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this is all done in the presence of persecution. And the, the reading today will, will talk about a little bit about that persecution and why we have it. And then it, we'll, we'll talk about the, the key verse, what are we supposed to do, and that is for proclamation of the gospel of Christ. In, in Peter, so far we've found out that suffering is necessary, which is not a nice thing to, to hear. It's not encouraging maybe to hear. The suffering is necessary to show first that we have faith. Uh, people without faith will not respond the same as people with faith in Christ. When tribulation and trials come, they will turn away. So it's necessary that we have persecution to show our faith. And it's also necessary to have, our, to have persecution to grow our faith. Um, there's a guy at work that I don't know well. I'm learning, learning more about him again. Uh, we're doing a PHA, so I get to be sitting with folks for... 40 hours a week, um, and we have at least 15 minutes of break a day, plus 30 minutes for lunch, so it's, it's you know, pretty busy. But what we're talking, he, he's not eating our lunches. Uh, he's doing a high-carb diet, which you, know, you hear about people doing low-carb diets. He's doing a high-carb diet. He's trying to get something around six or 8,000 calories a day. Uh, most of us would not do well with that. But the reason he's doing it is he's burning off something around six or 8,000 calories a day. He's doing uh, weight training. And so it's noticeable. He, his arms are bigger around than my arms. He, he is working. And how do you work? Not by sitting around eating like I do, but eating and getting out there and doing something. So it grows the muscle by doing physical activity. It grows our faith by having trials come our way. So trials are necessary to grow us. And, and he is reminding them of their position in Christ, that we're saved by grace. Uh, we are to live out our salvation. Uh, to, uh, you know, I think it's uh, Paul who says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not that we need to find out if we are or to save ourselves more, but it's to say, here's what salvation is. Now go figure it out. Go, go learn all the things you can about your salvation. Fulfill it. Work it out in your lives. In trials, which we will face, we need... Uh, God's grace, we need to live a holy life in the, midst, in the midst of trials, and we need to show love to each other, because every one of us, in serving Christ, will be facing trials and tribulations, and we need to uh, practice uh, spiritual living ourselves. We need to live according to the way the Spirit's called us to live. And today, uh, it's kind of, it is the, the big statement that he's going to be making, and then uh, we'll, we'll find out the, the remainder of what, what we're, how we're supposed to live out this life in persecution. So we'll start at verse 4. To whom coming, uh, so already there's a pronoun. Who is that whom? You kind of have to back up, right? But uh, if you had to guess, you'd get the church answer. To whom are we coming? To Jesus, right. It's not a squirrel, it's Jesus. So who coming, to whom coming, as unto a living stone. So Jesus is called a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, rejected of men, disallowed. When men, when Christ came, men saw him, Peter was there when it happened, and they discounted him. So Christ was discounted, disallowed by men, but Jesus Christ was chosen of God and is precious to him. So we have two things happen. Christ disallowed, rejected, uh, persecuted men, but Jesus Christ beloved of the Father and precious to him. 
And what was the term that they used to describe Christ here? Coming to Christ as unto a living stone, an alive rock. That sounds weird to us. But it's important we know that he's talking about Christ as a living rock, a lively stone. You also. So who's he talking to there? To who the letter's written to? Who's the letter written to? The elect strangers scattered abroad? Us. You also as, what's he called you? His children. Living sons. So who is he saying that we're like? Christ. We are to be Christ-like. So mm -hmm. we're used to that Christ-likeness or being like Christ or Christian, but we are also lively stones. Christ was called a lively stone or living stone. We are to be Christ-like in that we are lively or living stones. We are being built up a spiritual house. God is building his kingdom from those who are in Christ. A holy priesthood. What were priests supposed to do? Offer up spiritual sacrifice. I offer up sacrifices. So we are offering up spiritual sacrifices. The priests were the intercessors between God and man. So what are we to do? Intercede between God and man. Uh, is that just to intercede on our own behalf? No, we are to intercede on behalf of all men. Uh, evil men? Evil men, good men, women, I should maybe say people, good people, bad people, all people. We are to be intercessors on their behalf because we've been called to a holy priesthood. We are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And that's why our work is acceptable to God. Why is our work acceptable to God? Because it's by Jesus Christ. What if... Uh, I was unsaved and still preaching the gospel. What was the benefit to me in doing that work? None. There may, now God can make his word go out any way God wants to, and God can make his word effective, but I cannot offer acceptable spiritual sacrifices to God as an unbeliever. I can, you know, I can go to 1 Corinthians where Paul says, I gave my, if I gave all my goods to feed the poor, if I gave my body to be burned, if I you know, had all knowledge and all that sort of stuff and did everything right, but I did not have God in my heart, did not have love, it is profitless. So the world, even when they do good things, are not doing acceptable works to God because they're not doing them by Jesus Christ, not with the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Wherefore, also it's contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, so going back to the lively, living stone, the lively stone, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. And we talked about this way back. Whenever we build a building today, we have squares and measurements and all sorts of stuff. And it takes a long time to get a square building. Uh, Paul has witnessed me trying to square something up. And I'm probably slower than others. But you drive some stakes out there, you stretch a line. And then you stretch another line. And then you do another one and you get your four sides. And you try to measure out and get close, but you can be wrong in a whole bunch of ways. You can be wrong this way or that way, and you can be wrong this way. So you have to measure all of the diagonals to get everything just square, and then you start making a foot. When they build a building, what they would do, since they, I won't say they lack the technology because they built the pyramids, but the way that they would do it is they would get a nice square rock, square stone, big one, and they would line it up exactly how they wanted the building to be, and then they'd build the whole rest of the building off of that chief cornerstone. It's their point of reference. Everything goes back to that rock. We want it lined up perfectly east-west, and north-south is square, and now we start building around it. Well, Christ is our chief cornerstone. He was, he was uh, elect of God, laid for us to follow, and it talks about the foundation of the apostles. They kind of built in around that chief cornerstone and made the foundation then of the, the church that was going to follow. But the scripture says, this is Old Testament, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, so Christ is living stone, is elect and precious of God, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded or condemned. Unto you, therefore, which believe 
He is precious. This is the building. This is, this is what we are all founded upon. If we are in Christ. To him that believe, he is precious. But then it contrasts that, those who believe, with another group. And it says, but to them that are disobedient. So how does it, this is kind of interesting, how does it relate uh, uh, belief in Christ? What's, what's the thing that equates belief to? Or disbelief? And to you, therefore, that believe, he is precious, but to them which are, it doesn't say unbelieving. What's it say? Disobedient. So in Scripture, <clears throat> believing and obedience are just like hand in hand. If someone says they love the Lord and, does, don't, and they don't do what he says, guess what? They don't love the Lord. Obedience and belief are tied hand in hand. So those who don't believe, those who are disobedient, this same stone, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. And I uh, can associate a little bit with this. This is maybe a story to relate how, how a, a rock could be offensive to you. Um, in my house in Ohio, we were trying to put in a new basement because it was always damp. Because it's always been damp, there's pitting in the floor, and it was always damp. So we could we needed more room. We couldn't do it the way it was. So I'm going to do something real smart and like lower it down to the footer, put in drainage, and then put in a new concrete floor. And in the northeast corner of the house was in the basement was every rock that they had dug up, I think, when they were building the house. And so I dig down to the third all the way around so I get to this corner and the rocks are so stuck together and, and such a size that I might spend, it's like digging in Jamaica, I might spend four hours one evening digging to get out something about the size of two of those speakers stuck together. And I thought, and I did. I mean, this is like a, a prayer to God. God, I cannot do this. I mean, I, I can't. It, to, you know, I need to do the size of a fourth of the pews, and I'm doing that each night. It's never going to get done. Those rocks were offending to me. They were in my way. Christ is in the way of our God. <laughs> He's offensive to us because we are disobedient. But to those who believe, he, He's there for a reason. I can fight these rocks, or I can get in line with them. And Christ is there in everybody's way for them to make a decision. Am I going to be part of this building that has Christ as a cornerstone and, and the apostles as a foundation, or am I going to be offended by that and, and turn away and do my own thing? And those who do their own thing are disobedient to God. But then it comes back to the beginning of what I saying, that you, you, right now, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Go up above, he said, to him down into the, uh, you are being, uh, and the, the uh, verb tense is, in verse 5, you are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. The verb tense down in verse 9 says, and you are. So it's a, it's a now, and it's a later thing. When we are saved, we, we become the spiritual house of the Holy Priesthood. As we live our lives, we are becoming more of this spiritual uh, house of royal priesthood. And we need to make sure we're living that out today. It's not something that's going to happen in the future, but it's happening today. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or a people for his own possession or purpose, peculiar in ownership, that you, so you are all these things, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a chosen race, some versions may say, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, for a reason, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who or which in times past were not a people, we were, we were lost, we were the children of Satan, but now we are a people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy.
So let's pray. Our Father, my God in heaven, thank you for this day that you've given us and for your word that you've given us and for the hope you've given us in Christ. We, we speak of all those things of peace and joy and love. But Father, you have appointed us also for trials and troubles to be conformed through those more and more into the image of Christ. Christ, our, our Lord, our, our Master, our Teacher, was made perfect, though He was your Son and you in the flesh, and perfect already, but He's made perfect through suffering. And Father, you are perfecting us through suffering. Though for a time it may be inconvenient, it is working in us a far more exceeding weight of glory. So help us to endure, maybe even embrace the trials and troubles that you send before us, and help them not affect the testimony that we have for you only in that we may give it more earnestly, more passionately, more um, engagingly to the culture that you put us in. We are where you want us to be. Help us to live out the calling that you've called us to where you, have, where you have planted us and help us to spread your word to missionaries throughout the whole world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are, we are becoming Christ-like day by day. And that is, he doesn't, Peter doesn't really mention persecution here, but he does. I mean, it's not like you're persecuted, you're tried, you're troubled. But he mentions Christ, the chief cornerstone. He says, he was rejected of men. That is, that is the, the summary, that's the hint, that's the, the presentation of the persecution that we, were, we would face. We are disallowed, rejected, marginalized, cast aside, set aside by the world around us. Why? Because that's what they did to Christ. They have rejected me, they will reject you. They have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Peter is saying that we are becoming Christ-like, and because we're coming Christ, becoming Christ-like, we will face persecution. And we are becoming more conformed to his image as we face these trials and tribulations. And, and though Christ had to face those trials and tribulations, it also says how God felt about him. You know, this is the chief, this is a living stone, uh, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen, precious to the Father. We are becoming living stones. What are we to the what are you to the Father? You are precious. You are uh, uh, get the right words, chosen of God and precious. He he has his favors upon you, even in trials and tribulations. And if we wonder then we need to remember Christ, who, who faced trials and tribulations that we, we can never imagine. But he still brought glory to God, and we in the same way should still serve our Lord and Savior in the midst of troubles and persecutions. So we are becoming Christ-like more and more through our sufferings. We face opposition, just like Christ did, but there's another kind of opposition that we, we have overcome, I guess you could say, and that is the opposition against Christ. We face opposition because we are Christ's. Those who are not Christ's are opposed to him. They, they come to Christ, this stone, this precious stone, uh, this uh, chosen one of God. They come to him, and it says it becomes a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. It is, is talking about the unsaved because they are they disbelieve the the things about Christ, and so they, they are offended and walk away. But it's also showing this, and maybe even more. Well, look at my examples here. How many of you have things go exactly how you plan them to go? Okay, so some of you do things and they don't go the way that you would like. Well, if God can't even fix this little thing, then, you know, I'm through with him. All I want to do is this, and if God can't do it, you know, I'm done. It's a, a rock of offense. They may have asked for God to do something, he didn't do it, 
they are offended. Uh, do you ever feel like people are accusing you of things that you never really did? Some people may be offended about it. Did they ever accuse Jesus of doing things that he didn't do? Yeah, they accused him of that, and they accused him of doing things, or, or not doing things he should have been doing, but he was perfect. But people will get accused, and they'll, they'll walk away. Um, have you ever felt mistreated by somebody in other ways? Christ went through that over and over again to be the perfect, perfectly obedient Son of God. He never became offended by the Father in the trials and troubles that the Father allowed him to go through. I think these verses are saying kind of what John's saying. They didn't continue with us because they were never part of us. And it goes back to what he said about our trials being necessary first to show that we have faith. When trials come in some people's lives, when things don't work out the way they think God should work them out in their life, when serving God becomes, you know, too much of a burden and I'm offended by the things that he's making me go through, they disappear, not because they lost their salvation, but it was never there to begin with. They are offended by the things that God has called them to do. It, it bothers them, and they find out through practice that they never knew Him. So, there are those that in trials and troubles align themselves with Christ, and then there are those, when trials and troubles come, they depart from the faith, and they never return, because God didn't treat them the way that they thought they should be treated. And what is the kind of the base problem, and I'll, I'll help you out after I ask the question, what's the kind of base problem that we are facing when God does not do what we ask God to do that we think He should have done? He wants something for our own selfish reasons. Yes, our own selfish reasons. That is, you know, there's a whole, it's, it's like, what's the bigger sin? You know, there, there's a whole bunch of mouth, uh, a whole bunch of them out there, and, and we could categorize them in different ways. But I think the primary sin is pride. And today, I may change my mind next week, but that's what caused Satan to fall. That's what he used against Adam and Eve, is our own pride. And this leads into the next thing he says. Okay, how many of you have ever been uh, uh, falsely accused or mistreated or whatever? I think we all feel that way. And there's words of encouragement. You know, you're, you're being treated like the, the dirt. You're being treated like the dust of the earth. But, but you're not. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or a people of his own possession. So, when people are mistreating us, mistreating you, you can remember, you know what? They may be treating me this way, but guess who I am? I am a possession of God, a person for his own honor, uh, a royal uh, priesthood, a chosen generation. And I'm going, okay, now I'm going to depart from Scripture a little bit. Stay with me. So you all, you can just, you know, get out of here because I am the chosen one of God. Is that what he says we are the chosen ones for? To say to everybody around us, you may be treating me like dirt, but let me tell you, I'm a child of God. What does he say that we are supposed to do? We are his possession not to be proud in who we are before God and before the world. It's not for, we, we do not do this, we do not proclaim the message because we are proud. We proclaim it for his glory. We are in this position to show God's glory. And this is where I said in the class this morning, it's disappointing that Bill Cosby has been convicted because there are some things he said that, that make sense and are good examples to use sometime. But one of the Cosby Show quotes that I remember, or little scenes, is uh, the Hustables are sitting there. I think they're both doctors, aren't they? Is that, they're both doctors? I don't remember. They're both a lawyer, a doctor and a lawyer. And one of the kids comes in and they're all down faced. The people, the kids at school are making fun of me. 
because I'm rich. And they just say, I'm rich, and they got a silver spoon in my mouth, you know, they're making fun of me because I'm rich. And Mr. Huxtable says to her, your mother and I have lots of money, but you have nothing. And there's some truth in that. What did she do to get into the Huxtable family? She was born into it by the will of the mom and dad. What did we do to get into the kingdom of God? We were born into it. It's not of our own accord that we can say, look, I am a, I'm a royal priesthood now. No, it's because God did that for us. And that's the message we need to take out to the world. Is I, you know, you can make fun of me. You can do whatever you want. But there's a God who wants to... And go ahead and do the next page there. This God that we sing praises to has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who's that call available to? Whosoever will. So he's... We take the message out not because of who we are in Christ, but we take the message out of who God is. God has, has uh, made it possible for all of us to come out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time we were not a people, we're not people of God, but now we are the people of God. At one time we had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. And the world that we see around us is a world that has not fully realized the mercy of God because they're still living in sin, but they can obtain the full mercy of God and be saved. The folks that we rub elbows with have come to this rock and have decided they don't want to align their lives to it. But God is giving the message to them to, to come to Him. So we... So there's two, there's two pieces here. This, I, like to, I like to have invitations when we do the Sunday morning message. But if you have come to Christ and have seen what it is and turned your back without being saved, He is still making the offer to you today. He will still save you if you come to Him and align yourself with Him. If you choose, and you have this choice, if you choose not to align yourself with Jesus Christ and with God, He will become even more offensive to you. You will be separated from Him forever. You will sing Him, you will bow to Him uh, in hell, but you, you are banishing yourself forever from His presence. Or maybe you're saved, and you've come to him, and, or, or I'll do this one, maybe you weren't saved, you've been serving him, and you realize, you know what, well, I was never saved because these events have come, and I'm thinking I need to, to move away, I need to go on, I need to leave this behind. There's still, you know, if you're not saved, he will still save you. Then there's the next part, where maybe you are saved, you're facing these challenges and trials, and you're thinking, I don't think I can go anymore. We are here to help encourage you in that walk. Um, our faith tells us that God is good and that God knows what we can bear and He's only bringing upon us what He has prepared us for and what He can carry us through. And if we look earlier in Peter, if He brought to us things we could manage, it would not be then for His glory. So He will bring to you things that are beyond your abilities so that when you work through it with Him, you can say how great God is in His love for us. And then that brings us to the fourth part, and that's the end. It's like, you, you are going to heaven through Jesus Christ. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen people. You are peculiar to God's service. You are His possession. That doesn't mean we're done. That means we're beginning. And we need to carry out to the world this marvelous love that God has shown that He would take a world that was dark and black in sin and move it in to the kingdom of God. So if you need prayer today for any one of those, I, I 
come to, I've never come to Christ, I've come to Him, but the things that He's required are more than I'm willing to give up. You've come to Him and you're, you're indeed saved, but the challenges you're facing are just about to bring you down. Or, you're, you're His, He is working you through the challenges, but you need to carry that message out more. We're here to pray and encourage you, pray for you and encourage you in that today. So if musicians will come up, it's page 312, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, uh, he's waiting, watching, I think I've skipped verses, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Let's all stand, 312. It's not exactly the same verse, but it probably had it, may have had it in mind. For Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest, not for your bodies, but for your souls. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance to you and give you peace. And why would you dismiss us in prayer? Lord, we thank you for another day in your house. We ask you to remember all the requests you made. Remember, as we travel, we each one, and we need to pray and be